Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today we are back with more maddening fan theories that both put a smile on my face and in some cases a deep, deep sigh within my soul. And as per usual, all of these theories today are going to be presented by our wonderful Grand Fleet members, and if you'd like to know how to get your comment into one of these videos, then simply click that red subscribe buttony thing, and make sure you stay up to date with all of our community posts, and it will also grant you regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed, which is amazing. And before we begin, this video is also sponsored sponsored by the Anime Collective, who make all sorts of fun anime-related clothing to display proudly in public. They have an incredible range of not only One Piece-based merch, but also a whole ton of other series, including Hunter x Hunter, Naruto, Jojo, and more than likely, whatever you want. There's a link in the description below with a 10% discount code as well, which is pretty great because worldwide shipping is also available, and they have sizes up to 5XL, along with plenty of reviews and testimonials to peruse at your leisure. So instead of sitting there, likely naked as per usual, go and clad yourself in some of this fine streetwear. But but for now, I need you to hit me with some crazy theories. So let's begin with, the heads of Raizo and Kaido are the same size. <sighs> so I could have sworn I used the word theory, not pointless gibberish, but whatever, let's run with it. My mind actually had a very difficult time coming to terms with this statement because Raizo is a big boy. However, Kaido is a bigger boy, standing about two and a half Raizos tall. Raizo being 10 foot two and Kaido being a fairly ridiculous 27 feet tall, which would be 3.1 and 8.3 meters respectively for the rest of us. However, when it comes specifically to the realm of heads, if you don't count the horns, which we never do, Kaido's head is actually really, really small in proportion to the rest of his body, like super tiny. So not only could Kaido and Raizo's heads be the same size, I would actually bet on the idea that Raizo's head is bigger. So take from that what you will, which is not much. Kuzan joined the Blackbeard Pirates to prevent Teach from kidnapping Robin. Well, at least this one is a theory, but it's not quite crazy enough because the more I think about it, the more or I, no, I can't say it. I was going to try and say the more reasonable it sounds. However, I really can't bring myself to accept that this would be Kuzan's driving force to affiliate himself with the nefarious Blackbeard. Then again, Kuzan and Robin are one of those nice little background links playing out in the series. He's the one responsible for her survival on Ohara. And they also had that nice moment at the end of Water 7. So I can see a situation where he uses his position within the Blackbeard fold to Robin's benefit. But if she really was his unwavering goal, then just go and join the Straw Hats or even the Straw Hat Grand fleet. It's a much less convoluted way of preventing Robin's kidnapping. I'm also hoping that Blackbeard doesn't need Robin either, and he somehow got his own method of reading the ancient language, because I'm just not too keen for another rescue Robin scenario in the series. Luffy's red hawk attack is just Sanji's Diablo Jamba, but in his arm. All right, I see. So if I understand what you're saying here, you're claiming that Luffy blatantly plagiarized Sanji and should be taken to One Piece court immediately, which I suppose is a bit awkward because Luffy destroyed the judicial island, so that's not quite possible. Unless, unless that was part of his master plan all along. He stole Sanji's technique knowing that Sanji had no mechanism of legal recourse. This man is an evil genius. To be honest though, I don't mind the idea of Luffy seeing Sanji's attack and going, huh, I wanna do a thing like that, but it isn't just generated in the same way. Red Hawk is a kind of weird attack all around though, and there are very detailed theories about how it quote unquote works, none of which I'm going to go into, but this does lead nicely into our next crazy theory, which is simply elemental haki. Now, since this is only two words, I kind of have to insert my own explanation into this theory, but I suppose it indicates the idea that haki users, when they push their mastery far enough, can either convert or generate an element. In Luffy's case being fire, which provides an easy explanation for Red Hawk, but also may or may not destroy the One Piece world as we know it. Because then things probably devolve into an avatar-like structure with elemental matchups and perhaps some big bad villain having mastered all of the elements and it would just continue to pull focus away from Devil Fruits, which is something that's already being quite neglected as is. It is an interesting thought, maybe, but not quite as interesting as. The series will climax with a race back to Gaimon's Island where the One Piece is located. Now uh, yes, so Laugh Tale is the island of strange animals. I mean, that would be pretty perfect because no one, and I mean no one, would ever consider landing there if they were on some sort of, you know, serious pirate journey. However, Roger is taken there, he spots Gaimon, and he just laughs because that is what our lifelong journey has come to, hence Laugh Tale. I don't mind the idea of Laugh Tale being located in one of the blues though, rather than the new world. It might give Luffy and the crew a good excuse to go back and do a montage of the greatest hits of their journey, but yeah, I still think it'll be in the new world. Whitebeard called himself Whitebeard despite only having a moustache because he wanted to see if anyone would have, have the balls to call him on it to his face. Nobody ever did. <laughs> 
I like this image much better than the actual explanation, which has to do with the meaning of the word hige in Japanese. It's just a vague term for facial hair. But really, this is the kind of thing that one could do as the strongest man in the world. It's like how Benedict Cumberbatch pronounces the word penguin as pangwang. Penguins. Crested penguins. Parent penguin. Why are these woodlands so attractive to penguins? There's no way he doesn't know the word penguin. He's just trolling because he knows that nobody is going to call him out on his Pang Wang related crap. So I do like the mental image of Edward Newgate going, you know what, I'm gonna call myself White Beard and I'm gonna see how many idiots go along with it. One Piece is just one piece of the whole treasure. After the series is completed, there will be a sequel called The Remaining Pieces. Oh, I've never quite thought about things like this before and I like it. I like it a lot. Although it does fill me with a bit of dread because it almost certainly means that the story of One Piece or indeed the One Pieces will not be completed within my lifetime. And I guess the remaining pieces would be sort of like Hunter Hunter's Dark Continent. We reach the end of the series, pull the camera back and realize that the One Piece world we've explored is but a speck of sand in an even more gigantic world to explore. And I suppose in that case, I'd need to pass on some inherited will to my children to finish the series because I certainly will not. Luffy can asexually reproduce and is already pregnant. Hmm. Luffy is short for Lucifer. He was called Lucy in Dress Rosa as a shortening of that. Luffy is the name his friends call him, like Treble referring to Doflamingo as Dofi. Luffy is the son of the devil. So if I, if I understand your sentence correctly, Luffy is short for Lucifer. However, Lucy is also short for Lucifer and Lucy is short for Luffy, but his friends call him Luffy. Or do his friends call him Dofi? I don't know anymore. But yeah, Monkey D. Lucifer. I mean, symbolically, yes, Luffy and the entire D clan are portrayed as devils in the series, but it's probably quite a bit of a stretch. It does sound like something Dragon might do though. You know, he's sitting down with Luffy's mother, testing out names and throws Lucifer in there as a big F you to the world government and then he has to be argued down to Luffy. But whatever, this is not and never will be a thing. I have a theory for you. That straw hat at Reverie is normal sized, Emu is just small. <laughs> This is pretty brilliant. So all of those assumptions and ideas about Joy Boy being a giant are completely false. And in fact, it's the other way around. Emu is actually a dwarf. And when he sits on the empty throne, that's a simple perspective trick. The throne is actually much, much closer than it looks, but it's so small that it looks so far away. To give Emu a more imposing look to the the, uh, the nobody that ever sees him sit on the throne. Saw this theory in an OP Facebook group. Moria will revive Ace using his power. All right, this one I wanted to include not so much for the specific Ace theory, but just to highlight the Moria Resurrection Brigade. This theory is almost as versatile and widespread as Luffy's mother is X, where X is the person that even Kov changed the gender of. But people really refuse to let go of Moria though. And every now and then you'll see this pop up. You know, Moria is going to resurrect the body of Ace and Luffy will fight his brother in dramatic combat. Or Moria will resurrect Whitebeard and Luffy will have to fight the strongest man in the world in dramatic combat. Or even Moria will resurrect Goldie Roger and Luffy will have to fight him as the final obstacle to becoming the Pirate King in, of course, dramatic combat. Basically, here's how the One Piece fandom breaks down. If you're alive, then you are Luffy's mother. And if you're dead, then Moria is going to resurrect you. Those are your options. In some moment of the series, Buggy will remove one of his arms and give it to Shanks, even if it's just temporarily. So the Yonko can use all of his power in both arms. I love it. It'll never happen, but I really want to see this Buggy Shanks team up in some kind of fan art. It'll be just like when Zoro had to use Usopp as a sword, Hana Arashi or No Storm, I believe he named it. But just imagine that all of the power of an Emperor of the Sea in one arm and all of the power of a muggy bull in the other. It's just too much for this world. The D is the name given to the crew of Joy Boy. Hence, they all look so different. They are all family, not in term of bloodlines, but in terms of wills with a capital W. And quite frankly, this isn't crazy enough. I actually don't mind this idea at all. Like what if the D crew are the world's oldest prominent pirates and all of their members are given a mighty D to wield? It does really make me want a D fishman though, because right now it is just humans and giants, but it's also a much more fun idea than everyone of the ancient kingdom just having Ds for reasons. And it's very much in the spirit of One Piece, isn't it? Like on Alabasta where the whole crew got marked with an X, except the D took on a bit more meaning. Anyway, it's too good. I don't like it. Please give me more trash. Fujitora will bring down the moon and this
this is how NL is going to have his comeback. Perfect. This is exactly what I was looking for. And I do like the thought of it happening, mostly because of NL's inevitable comical reaction as his moon is being brought down to the planet because he'd have this face on the entire time. All right, this next comment is long and just FYI, if you do want to be featured in one of these videos, please, please, please do not post essays. I won't read them. This one is a rare exception because the first line kind of took my interest. I haven't seen anyone say anything about this, though I'm sure they have, but I think Zoro may somehow have a similar physiology to the South Birds, except that his internal compass is only functional on Wano. And I'm not going to read the rest because uh, you get the general idea. Just sum up your theory in a sentence or two and success. But this is also a fun thought, equating Zoro to a South Bird, except no matter where he is in the world, he is drawn to Wano. Dude can just internally sense where all of the nice swords and swords men are. And just thinking about it, how bizarre is it that we're on the undisputed capital of swordplay and Zoro has yet to fight against a single relevant swordsman. In fact, thinking about it, he really hasn't fought a proper swordsman since Fishman Island because snow girls and stone boys are not swordsmen. Sanji has mastered Okama Kenpo and will only use it or incorporate aspects of it into his black leg style if he finds himself in a dire situation. And I think the idea actually gets much worse than this because in a truly dire situation, not only will Sanji invoke Okama Kenpo, but I actually suspect that he will need to whip out the dress in order to use these techniques to their full capacity. It's sort of like putting on the raid suit to access his germa related needs. Sanji could be a man of many outfits. Smoker is smoking and wearing himself. Wait, what? Smoker is smoking and wearing him. Smoker is, you know what? I think we're done here. But what do you guys think? Please do leave your thoughts in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, then please do go and check out some of my other content or even subscribe to the channel for more glorious One Piece business uploaded straight into your YouTube feeds. But for now, this has been the Grand Line Review and I'll see you next time.